Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. And by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code KNOWHOW when you check out. Today on Know How, we're finishing up Alien X. Your questions are answers, and Brian makes a smartwatch. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch Nailed show it. where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next hour, maybe? Uh, give or take. We're know. feeling a little loopy tonight. Yeah, we're doing a little yeah. pre-record action. Yeah. so We're going to we'll be just... bringing you the stuff that we've been working on because we want you to geek out. <laughs> and Alex can't stop us. And Alex can't <laughs> stop us tonight because there is no show after this. <laughs> nice. That's right. So uh, what have we been geeking out on? Well, you know, the first thing we've been geeking out on are... Shields. Shields? Shields. Like Project Shield? No. No. Like, like the Space NVIDIA Shields? shields. Spaceship Shields? Yeah. What, what? Now, when you think of Shields in sci-fi, you think of like Star Wars or Star Trek. It's either yes. like a bubble or... It or, deflects asteroids exactly. or protects you against uh, missiles Enemy and fire. phasers. and yeah. Blah, you know, it's, it's just an energy thing, right? right. It, it's it, not possible, it, though. It's... Well, what? maybe, maybe not. Okay, now, it's not what you see in the movies. Like, for hmm. example, in Star Trek, depending on which technical manual you read, it's either an all-encompassing energy shield yeah. or you also have deflector shields which combine transporter and replicator technology in order to create... A thin okay, yeah, you're bored now. <laughs> right, as long as you uh, divert enough power from the engine. Yes, yeah, sir. exactly, yeah. otherwise you blow up. Right. You know, we know <laughs> clearly. Warp core beach is bad. Clearly, clearly. Now, now, we all know that shields aren't real, except maybe now... They are. They just aren't the ones that we know from sci-fi. And this comes from Boeing. Uh, Boeing has been working on a way, not necessarily to create a shield, but to create a way to attenuate shock waves. Uh, so creating like a little, like a buffer zone or kind something? Kind of, yeah. It's, it's, so in that sense, it is a shield. So what we know about a shock wave, shock waves kill, right? Even, right. even more than shrapnel. Shrapnel's bad for you, but... Whenever you have such a large overpressure from like an exploding mortar round, it just tends to demolish everything in the way, right. especially if it's organic, right? That shock wave, shock wave hits a human, and you you get obliterated. It's like obliterated. that uh, Terminator, like Terminator, when <laughs> like right. when yeah. people are holding onto the fence and then they go. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not a good thing. But what but hmm. Boeing what Boeing figured out is that a shock wave is just like any other energy wave. Now think about this, think about light and mm -hmm. passing light through a prism. It passes through media of different density, and that's why you get that separation of colors, right? Right. Or think about a, a pool. In a pool, a very calm pool, you have a, a ripple that emanates out from one point, mm -hmm. and if it runs through like a patch of ice or anywhere where the water has slightly different densities, you'll see that ripple start to dissipate. Or even better, if you're if you're a submarine buff, you know that one of the ways that you can hide from enemy sonar is you go above or below what's called the layer, the saline layer. Hmm. And what happens is it's a it's a layer of water where because of the salt content, the density is different, right. and it distorts. The, the energy wave, the, the sound wave as it travels, and you, you basically become invisible. Okay, okay, right? cool, cool. So stuff. this is using the same principle, and what Boeing has realized is that they could somehow toy with the density of air in front of the target that you want to protect, uh -huh. and they could attenuate the, the blast wave. Not completely stop it, but at least get it down below lethal levels. 
That sounds pretty cool, but how, how would you ever do that? You would use it. You would do it using electricity. <laughs> I mean, I would use it on like, you know, people coming too close to me or something like okay, that. Okay, well, you, actually, that would <laughs> probably be effective against that, too. Uh, <laughs> what, they've, what they've done is they've realized they can store a power in a bank of, of supercapacitors. And then if you had a, a good enough computer that could, could calculate how fast the oncoming shockwave is coming, uh -huh. you use it to run that power through an arc generator. An arc generator would generate plasma, which will superheat air right in front of the target, changing the density of that air, and it would it would basically make the shock wave divert around the thing that you want to protect. It wouldn't stop it. You'd still get hit by the shock wave. Right. But, but it would again, dissipate it. Dissipate it, get it down below that lethal lethal level. Wow. Does so does this uh the arc generator exist and the the can this, have they tested this? Well, I mean, we've got our generators. We know, okay. I mean, we could make one on know-how. All, all you need is a, a way to generate enough, enough current, enough voltage, uh, something that would actually create the arc. So we could do that. The, okay. the one issue they have is at the moment, the technology could only maintain that arc for a very limited time. So you would hmm. really need to time it so that that arc went up just as the shockwave hit. Hmm. Uh, at some point, if, if power storage and power generation in, increases, they would be able to maintain that arc for a longer period of time. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So is the, the application for this, what's the envision for that? Is just to protect from shock waves? Or? Shock waves. Right. Yeah. So I mean you think so about like it. A for, war zone thing? This it is small enough to put it onto a, a Humvee. It is small enough to put it onto a tank. And hmm. and you could actually have large scale applications on buildings which you really would want to pr uh, protect against shock waves. Hmm. Yeah. Now <laughs> there is one little side effect. <laughs> okay. What's the catch? It's, it's, it's not actually that little. No. Uh, passing that much voltage through the air and creating a plasma arc big enough to attenuate a shock wave yeah. would actually screw with the body's natural electrical system. So it would render anyone who was near it unconscious. So you would protect them, what? <laughs> but they would be incapacitated probably for a, a while. Uh, I mean, I guess if I had to choose between <laughs> being disintegrated or being knocked unconscious for an un unknown amount of time, I'd choose that. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, so, okay. yeah, if, if it's, not like, it's not like you're going to want to test this because if you, right. you turn the thing on and <laughs> you're all out. It's, okay. You know. This is cool, though. This is like a force field generator kind of like some block stuff. Yeah, and this is just the beginning. I mean, the, the, the physics is actually very sound. So hmm. this, this is not something that they're reinventing. They're just taking advantage of physical properties we already know. They're just saying, well, how can we kind of scale this up to hmm. become useful? Okay. And uh, who knows? I mean, uh, there was there was an application that was a little bit like this, but for spacecraft, they were looking at a way to protect spacecraft, re-entering spacecraft from the immense heat of re-entry right. without having to burden them with massive heat tiles. Right, right. A and they were looking at this same sort of thing, a plasma arc generator that would create an area of, of uh, differing density around the nose of the craft, which would deflect enough of the heat so that you wouldn't have to burden the thing down with you know, ceramic and asbestos and whatever else you're going to use. Okay. So it's a technology that I think will grow, and now Boeing has a patent on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, when you said it first at Boeing, I was imagining they were going to put uh, like a force field in front of the engines or something so that birds <laughs> didn't fly into them. But. Well, I mean, it would be really hard to maintain a, a plasma arc in front, <laughs> in of, front the of the engine. I don't, I don't think you really want to do that. See engine. these smoking bird corpses falling from the sky? Also, a plasma arc would create a whole lot of ozone, which would actually choke out the engines, yeah. which would be a bad thing. Okay. And then yeah. also there's a little thing of like you would knock out everyone on the plane. <laughs> I guess we, yeah, that would be bad. Okay. Yeah, and I guess you can't but use it in space, so it's I, not like so. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no air to superheat in space. So okay. you do need an atmosphere for this to work. <laughs> okay. okay. Cool stuff, though. Cool stuff. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll get Star Trek. <laughs> now, uh, let's move from Star Trek to something that's a little bit more practical. We've had a couple of questions from the chat room and in the Google Plus group that we want to get to. Uh, before we do this, I will mm -hmm. say, we had planned to do a VLAN demonstration. That's why I got my trusty DDWRT right here. Yes. Uh, we had a little issue. Um, we've known this. DDWRTs, especially on the original WRT54Gs, tiny bit flaky. Yeah. And it worked fine back in my studio, and I had the demo all set up. Mm -hmm. And then I brought it here, and I've spent the last two hours trying to make it work the way it worked back in the studio. And it's... <laughs> 
<laughs> That's because this is a, uh, a, a no testing zone. Yeah, we used to do all our testing on this set and then nothing ever worked. It's like so. the ghost of projects past or something. Something like that. Yeah. So we on. will bring it to you because you can do VLANs with a DDWRT. You just got to be really careful. Yes. They, yeah, they require a lot of resetting. Right. Um, I'm probably going to record it in the studio and just and get it, it that there way. and then bring it in. Yeah, because the live demonstration, I just I don't want this in the conk out in the middle. Yeah, no, that's good, and and I can attest to you frustratingly was, working on this so while I was doing weird. TDing over there. Oh, so. Well, because it was like, wait a minute, oh, you were working. Why is this? Why working? are you not working? And when I see Padre go to Russell for help, I know it's pretty serious. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like, Russell, the stuff's broken. Please, <laughs> please, fix it, please, <laughs> fix it, fix, Russell. Fix it. I'm tired of this. <laughs> All right, but we right. do have a question from a, a, a fan of the show on Twitter from mm -hmm. Isaiah. Wilkerson and uh, Brian. He asks, "Can I NAT a NAT to add a DDWRT router behind the UVerse router? Only the TVs are on the UVerse NAT. I've set up a subnet on the new router, but I can't figure out how to tell the UVerse router that there is another one behind it." This is hmm. actually I heard this at least a dozen times after the last episode. People wanted to know about natting a NAT, yeah. and remember, we we both we were both in agreement that. You really don't want a NAT a NAT, but sometimes you've got no choice. Sometimes special situations. Yeah. Special situations are you limited by the gear that you have. Yeah. So you know we're going to explain how this actually works. So we're going we're going to look at this. Oh, and by the way, last week I realized that there was a mistake on the board. Thank you everyone who pointed this out. Uh, 10.0.0.0 is not a slash 24. It is a slash, slash eight. eight. It's a class A. It's the entire anything that starts with 10 is a non-public, non-routable address. Okay. okay. Well, let's go back to this. So this was the example we used for NATing. We've got the internet. We've got our NAT, our initial NAT, our initial router, and then you've got NATs on the NAT. NAT, right? Yeah. So NAT of NAT, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that you said, uh, um, Isaiah, made sense, and that's you've got a NAT of a NAT. So you've got your uh, U-verse router here, and then you've got one NAT. The other thing that you said, which is you're not sure how to make this NAT know about this NAT, that didn't make so much sense, because mm. this NAT will not really know about this NAT. You don't, there is no configuration to tell this router that the devices of this NAT exist. Right. Right. That's the point of a NAT. You know, you only have one external looking device. Oh, you've, you've played with this, right, Brian? I have played with this, and it was kind of frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what we want to do is we're going to give you the closest thing that I can think of that will give you what I think you asked for. And I'm sorry if this is not exactly right. Jump into the Google Plus group and you can, you can rephrase your question and I can help you more. If this is your U-verse uh, NAT, and I know the U-verse system is actually pretty locked down, you can actually set the DMZ for this NAT to mm -hmm. the IP address, hopefully the static IP address you have on this NAT, so that all the outside traffic can find this NAT, and then you can direct that traffic to whatever devices you want inside. Right, because the ports would be blocked on the second NAT, so you don't have to worry about DMZ to it. Right, right. So uh, this is what you've got. You've got your TVs all on this level, and then you've got your, your second NAT, your NAT inside your NAT here. <laughs> this might be 192.168.1.1. Right. You would want this on a different subnet, so 192.168.2.1. Right? right, and then you would tell the DMZ here to forward all external traffic to 192.168. That that whatever this was on the inside. Right, it's just a pass through basically. It's just a pass through. Now let me show you really quickly what this looks like on a DDWRT. Uh, Alex, if you go ahead and go to uh, this computer, I, uh, there we go. So if this is again, this is the DDWRT that isn't behaving right now. But every router is going to have something normally in the NAT area that will allow you to do what's called DMZ. Now, DMZ is just a really easy way to tell this thing to send all external traffic to one address. Now, since this router is working at 192.168.100. whatever, I'm going to say that my second NAT is 100.200. Right? Okay. So I would say, all right, go ahead and send all my traffic that comes in from that external port to 192.168.100.200. And now that second NAT is actually seeing the internet. Cool. Or the internet is now seeing that second NAT. That's a better way to put it. Now, can you DMZ on that second NAT to a specific address from that? Yes. Okay. So if you're really suicidal, <laughs> and you're like, you know, you know what? I hate security. <laughs> right. Then yes, you can DMZ to a device inside that second NAT. Okay. But as we, we've said many times, don't do that. No, okay. That's a bad idea. Uh, the only reason why I say it's okay here is because 
you're going into that NAT, which by itself will actually have its own security. Okay, and when I was doing some research on this sort of thing for the, um, I was trying to get my NAT open for my Xbox One, right. and it seems like a lot of these routers that are provided by the ISPs, uh, you can maybe call them and tell them to disable that ability yeah. and just make it a modem, so then you don't have like the NAT on that situation, and you can just play with, if you have a router, right. you can play with that. People tell me you can actually do that with Uverse. You can okay. actually contact them, or there might be a setting inside some of these routers that allows you to essentially turn off all the routing functions, mm -hmm. and it will act just like a modem. Yeah, the problem people were having is that they, they have to call right. to get this and to happen. That's annoying. Yeah. Uh, a DLR actually makes a very good point. Uh, he wants to know if, you know, wouldn't it be better just to forward specific ports? Absolutely. In fact, that's what we suggested. I believe it was Know how episode like one 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 uh, one eleven? Uh, I, I think. Uh oh, yeah, I can't the one remember. the one with the cameras, where we're showing you that that's actually much more useful. You can you can forward the specific port that you need for the specific service or device to that address. Mm -hmm. But we're also dealing with people who you know they they're having difficulty with NAT on NAT. So DMZ so. is one of the easiest way to do it. Yeah. And in this in this case. Because the DMZ is going to another NAT slash router slash firewall, I'm actually okay with that. That's not such a bad idea. Hmm. Cool. Well, I think we've pretty much answered that. Yeah, there you question. go, Isaiah. So uh, how about this? Um, let's go to Santa Claus. Santa Claus? No, I'm you sorry, mean Frederick, Frederick Claus. Claus. I think okay. that's like his cousin or something like so. that. Hmm. Uh, and his question is, is there a way to test RAM, CPUs, and motherboards in a computer without just replacing them to see if that fixes the problem? Hmm. Yes. Yes. There is. Better answer, no. Oh. <laughs> that doesn't sound like an answer at all. It's not. Well, I mean, yes, there is. Okay. okay. So there is. There absolutely is. Uh, in fact, Alex, I've got a link right there. The the one tool that I do keep in my toolbox, along with SpinWrite, mm -hmm. uh, which is Steve Gibson writes, is a program called MemTest86. I think <laughs> they're at version 6 right now. It's free. There's a pro version that has a, a couple more bells and whistles. But this essentially allows you to run loops against your memory to see if there's something wrong with the memory. So memory is super easy test to that. test. Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing. I mean, back in the day, it kind of made sense to, to burn in a lot of these systems. The problem is the quality control on these are so high that aside from memory, there's really not a lot that goes bad, especially in CPUs. In fact, Right. In all my years of, of building, testing computers, I have never had a CPU go bad. I have broken CPUs by overclocking them and overheating yeah, I was, them. <laughs> I was I, trying to think if I had either. <laughs> I have busted them, but I've never had like a factory defect of CPU. Normally, if something goes on a CPU, I did it, and I know yeah. I did it. Yeah, yeah. No, I've never had a CPU go. I've never had any bad RAM. And I've put together, you know, three or four computers in the last decade or so. Um, I've never had a hard drive die either. I've been kind of okay. lucky. I hope I'm not jinxing myself by admitting all that. But they will all die tonight. That was one of the. Yeah, I'm gonna get home and <laughs> say just, goodbye to your data. Um, that was one of the things. Whenever me and Alex were talking about building PCs, is like versus buying a PC. Is that if you, something went wrong, you'd have to diagnose it yourself. Yeah. But fortunately, that hasn't been too much of a problem for me. System diagnostics really come from a time where we were all building our own, and you would sometimes have major hardware incompatibility and you had to figure out where that was right that's kind of gone away I mean you still get it once in a while but everything as long as you get it to the right spec pretty much works with everything else yeah. again the memory is probably the first thing that I would check. That, yeah that's the easiest thing to check yeah it's because it's cheap and you can buy bad memory right you can you're probably not gonna buy a bad CPU and if it's the motherboard you're just kind of I was gonna say yeah. like that's the last thing you want to try and do is the yeah. motherboard yeah. like switch out the RAM see if that changes anything uh, I mean we've run into bad PSUs before if right. you got a cheap one of those but it also comes down to like what problems you run into exactly. like sometimes my computer would crash when I would load up a game or something and it was like oh my graphics card is drawing too much power and it's like rebooting the system and stuff like that yeah. you know? and you do start to notice certain symptoms that are associated with certain things like right. if it if it dies after running a lot of calculations a long time it's probably a cooling issue right. right if it dies when you're loading up a game okay yeah maybe the graphics card is pulling too much power well, what how much of how big of a power supply do i have in there uh, but what we often suggest is differential diagnosis 
And that really does assume that you have a lot of hardware lying around. We all, most of us do. Most of us have old computers and old parts that we can swap in and out. Plug and play. Yeah, because there is nothing that will tell you where the problem is, quite like replacing one component and suddenly the problem goes away and you go, oh, okay. that's, it, the, that's it. I'm hoping it was that, yeah. Right. <laughs> so. yeah. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'll say 70% of the time it is the memory. If you're having a, a problem, it's going to be the memory. Unless you look at your motherboard and like the capacitors are bloating. <laughs> I've never had that problem. I, I have had that, yeah. Uh, you know, I did have a Northbridge problem once. It was overheating. It was proper. It wasn't cooled okay, yeah. properly. I can see that. Can um, see that. But you know what? That was like a, I, the only reason I figured that out is because I went on Newegg and there was a bunch of people complaining about that. So I got a different cooler for my Northbridge and that fixed it. That's, that's okay. But that you know, that's specific to your certain hardware. Mm -hmm. It's great for geek, and I, you know, Isaiah, I'm I'm so happy that you're asking this because it means you're trying to diagnose your own computer. Uh, but a, a lot of us have gotten to the point where it's just it's not worth the time anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. you know it's pain in the butt, and it's not those components are not that expensive anymore. So absolutely, start to know what symptoms are what, and you will get to the point where you'll be able to diagnose what it is even without running a diagnostic. Yeah. Uh, but if you know if you're looking for that magic bullet and you think you're going to save money by doing your own diagnosis. It, I'll probably not. Yeah, and if you if, if this is something that you're really worried about, you could always get like the Acer Predator, so if, yeah. or you know like a Dell, and then if it goes wrong, you can send it back. Exactly. <laughs> it's like I'm not even gonna mess with it anymore. You yeah. fix it. Yeah. You, you sold this thing to me. <laughs> hey. All right, so. let's move on to one. I and I, I disclaimer: this is mm -hmm. a quadcopter question. We've had a lot of these. He represents one person who has had this issue, so we're gonna take this. Do question. we need like a separate banner for a like, quadcopter, quadcopter segment? Ahead. <laughs> Here it comes. <sighs> okay. I'm also surprised you didn't make like a catch-up joke about this one. I know. Okay, but let's catch up on that feedback. Michael Hines asked, uh, Augusta Wind, as I was coming from a successful flight and brushed a telephone line, flipped oh. and slammed into the ground. Yep, this is oh, the picture can, I was looking can at Can you earlier. enhance and enlarge? Because Oof. this is devastating. I, I don't know how hard you have to hit to make that happen to one of those frames, because those frames are tough. <laughs> Brian and I have both crashed our frames hard. Right. And like, we've never come close to that level of devastation. I mean, how fast was the sledgehammer going when it <laughs> ran into it? Hey, look, it's it's not just snapped. It's like the, the ends are like torn and twisted away. Every prop is broken. One of the, I've done the, that. I've done that. I've done that. But jeez, man. If those uh, wires weren't there, that thing would just uh, disintegrated <laughs> like a, from an explosion. No, Michael, we're not laughing at you. We're laughing with you because no. we and both, thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank because. you for sharing because uh, crashing is learning when you're flying, and we learn a lot. Uh, but this this is actually something that several people have expressed. Even with the Alien X, we had a couple of people who got a little impatient, <laughs> yeah, and they're like, yeah, they can't, right. I can't wait for your integration video." So they built them, yep. and they they crash them. Yeah, that um, happened to our DJI. Yeah, it happened to our got DJI. Got a little impatient. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you will learn eventually how not to, to do all the crashing, but we've also had a lot of questions about these motors, because these motors that come mm -hmm. with the uh, the Hobby King 250 kit that we've been suggesting, uh, these are nice because they're, they're powered right. They're, you know, they drive this thing much faster than you would get like a SEMA X5, but they're not so powerful that it will scare you away. Right. Uh, they're about 10 bucks from Hobby King, but these things are always on back order. And people have been asking, mm. well, uh, can I replace it? You know, I've bent my shaft. Can I, can I replace the motor with something else? Or uh, what, what is it compatible with? Because I don't want to have to replace all the other parts on, on my quadcopter. And Brian, there's a solution. There, there is? There is a solution. Well, uh, actually, Alex, if you could go to this first link, if you want an in, inexpensive replacement that is still better than the one from Hobby King, mm -hmm. try this one. This is a Ready to Fly Quads 1806, and we're going to make sure that we put the uh, the link in the show notes. It's 10 bucks. So you can same get a, price. Yeah, get the same price. You can get a set of four of these for 40 bucks. These are actually, I'd say, about... 50% again more powerful than the ones that came with the Hobby King kit. Hmm. Uh, they're the same size, so you're going to get about the same performance, a tiny, tiny bit more, uh, and you don't have to worry about any incompatibilities. This is not okay. going to draw too much power. It's, it's just going to bolt right on. It look almost exactly like the current ones you have but on your motors. Slightly your more motor. powerful. Slightly more powerful. So I guess if you're afraid that you're going to ruin that set of motors, you should get another set? Whenever I buy a set of motors, I buy six. <laughs> you buy six? Yeah, that's I'm, a... I'm, a, I'm thinking I'm going to break two. OK. All yeah. right. That's a good policy, yeah. I guess. Now, there's going to be those people who say, OK, all right, yeah. all right I know yeah. how to replace it. But what if I wanted to take a step up? 
If you wanted to take a step up, I would suggest you do this. This is the exact same frame. I've added the long frame, uh, but it's the same basic frame as that 250. Mm -hmm. These are actually ready to fly 2204s. And Alex, if you go to the link for these, this these are uh, 60 bucks for a set of four, so it's $20 more mm -hmm. than the other ones. But the amount of power increase is... <laughs> Are they quick? Ridiculous. <laughs> it's rid okay, and so the Hobby King motors are 50 watt. Uh -huh. And they will generate roughly, I think it's in the like, uh, all together, they'll generate uh, 400 grams of thrust, which is not bad because the thing doesn't weigh that much, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. These motors will generate 500 grams of thrust each. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that seems, I guess if you're going to strap a giant battery to it, then you might want that extra power, right? Well, the, the other nice thing about this is these motors will support 4S batteries. So if you <laughs> wanted to put in the larger cell, I mean, seriously, okay. when, when I peg like, this thing, it screams. It literally screams. You if can you go to the, the props. overhead, Alex, like you can, you can kind of see the size difference yeah, of these. The, the black ones are two times as big as yeah, these little ones. You could eat little, one of those. Little babies. But this is still not too crazy. It's only 150 watts. So it's three times more than mm -hmm. what you get out of one of these Hobby King motors, but uh, they're actually more durable. They're more dependable. I've slammed these into the ground. I have never even come close to bending a, a prop. All my shafts here are kind of bent, tiny bit. Yeah. Uh, and you can run that on the existing electronic speed control. So okay. the, this little 12 amp will take those motors, no problem. It will take the 4S or the 3S battery, no problem. $60, and you essentially get a craft that just handles completely differently. I mean, uh, it, is a, it is still a scary amount of power. I'm still not ready to <laughs> peg this thing all the time. This, I'll run at full throttle all the time. Yeah. Biggest advantage, they look really cool. They look really cool. I like the black ones, and they look really well made. Really? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Brian, those yeah. are our sane suggestions. Those are sa Wait, those are our sane ones? That yeah. means you have another suggestion? We've, we've got another suggestion. I don't think you could fit bigger motors oh, on this. Oh, yes, you can. Alex, huh? go ahead and bring up that third link. This is the 2208. Uh, same amount. You, you uh, can get four of these for 60 bucks. So it's kind of, it's tempting not to just grab these. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> Those Hobby King motors are 50 watt, right? Okay, yeah. This is 300 watts. <laughs> That's a little bit of a jump. It's a bit of a jump. Also, if you've got a 12 amp ESC like you do with the Hobby King 250 kit, yeah. you're gonna, you're really scraping the top. You're gonna, yeah. I mean, don't. You're pushing it? You're pushing it. You're like, you're in the danger close. zone. Danger zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really are. I mean, uh, Maverick. I, I, uh, you could do it as long as you don't like peak throttle a lot. You want to keep this thing near half most of the time. <laughs> um, but the nice yeah. thing about that is when you eventually upgrade your ESCs, your motors yeah. will be ready to go. See, here's the thing though. I know you like to push the limits a lot, but coming if somebody is replacing their motors because they crashed, I don't necessarily <laughs> think they're gonna leap to the Stop insane. Stop making sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like the suggestion. The suggestion, yeah. yeah. No, put it this way. Okay, so with the Hobby King, the base model, you're getting something like a 1.8 to 1 thrust to weight ratio, which is good. That's good for a trainer. That's what you yeah. want. This one gets you in the vicinity of like 6 to 1. Okay, that's still this, really this good. Is, yeah. This is pretty good. Those 2208s, which I have just strapped onto a new frame in my lab, that will get you something like 13 to 1. Wait, have you tried it out? Yes, have you flown it's it? So, it's too. I, uh, yes, I've flown it. I, and I put and it then it, it, it went to the moon, and you it's, didn't see it's, it again. It's yeah. scary. It's, it's, <laughs> it is so loud too. It's. Oh jeez. Yeah, I bet. Because these. I mean, these. The regular 250 sounds like an angry nest of bees. So. Remember the first time we fired that thing up, <laughs> and we've been flying the Seamers for a long time, and we're like, yeah. I'm like, what is that? It's uh, angry. It's it so is. angry. It's kind of scary. It yeah. sounds like the blades are going to break the sound barrier or something like that. Yeah. yeah. But, folks, so uh, there you have it. Things will break. But <laughs> don't look at breaking parts as a bad thing. No. It just means you get to upgrade. It's a chance to make it better, yeah, faster, yeah. Yeah. much and, scarier. Uh, we've actually got a segment coming up where we're going to show you. We're, we're going to start rating motors for you. So you don't go out and spend a lot of your money on motors that are not good. Mm -hmm. We're going to get a bunch in the lab. We're going to show you their, their characteristics, how much power they pull down, yeah. how much thrust they can generate, how long they can stay at full throttle, how much heat they build up. Mm -hmm. So we do that because, you know, we love you. I, yeah, I was just thinking, Padre's totally doing this for Everyone. It's for you. It's not, yeah. <laughs> I want to test everything, and it's for you guys. Don't you worry. Uh, so I have that quadcopter graphic ready next time we go into a quadcopter uh -oh. segment. There's a. Do you you have a? Should we oh, test it out now? Yeah, let, let's do it now. What what is it? What is it? Uh, what are we going to talk about next? Uh, we're talking about quadcopters. Mm.
Warning, quad. <laughs> 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 All right, folks, uh, when we come back, we're jumping back into Project Alien X. We've already done the, 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 the first part of the project where we mm -hmm. bought the parts and we've done the integration, but now we have to show you how to fit it out. How do you actually configure the flight controller? How do you set the center of gravity? And how do you get this thing ready to fly? But before we do that, let's What's go ahead that? and take a break because, Brian, we, we got to talk about the first sponsor of know-how. That's right. I mean, you were talking about breaking stuff, and sometimes you need a kit to... Well, I think stuff. I broke the kit. <laughs> well, folks, when you don't want to break stuff, when you want nope, to repair things, out. you're going to need iFixit. Now, what is iFixit? Well, Alex, if you go and run that B-roll, they'll know exactly what it is. iFixit is where you go not just to find the greatest tools, but also the greatest repair guides. iFixit is a free online repair manual for everything. They have more than 10,000 repair guides for everything from electronics like your smartphone, your tablet and game console, to your home appliances, your clothing, and even your bike. They also have foolproof instructions to fix all your stuff. So if you've shattered your iPhone screen, or if you need to repair the red ring of death on your Xbox, or swap the battery on your Galaxy S5, iFixit has got you covered with parts, tools, and repair guides. iFixit also makes the most trusted repair tools for consumer electronics, including this, the ProTech Toolkit. It's what I use for my quadcopter goodness. It's 70 tools to assist you with any mod, malfunction, or misfortune that comes your way. The toolkit is the gold standard for electronics work from garage hackers to the CIA and FBI, but more importantly, their unique tools are used by repair technicians everywhere. It includes their 54-bit driver kit with 54 standard specialty and security bits, things like Phillips bits and Pentalo bits, Torx and Torx security bits, tri-wing bits in case you've ever wanted to, to open up video games, and even the triangle bit that McDonald's use so you could hack their toys. I had to use that for my Game Boy. Yeah, exactly. Or this. That's the, the ESD. Well, that's not quite used right, but Alex was safe <laughs> for components. They've also got spudgers, so if you want to open up components the right way, you can use a spudger rather than using a screwdriver to crack it open. It's only $64.95, and it's backed by a lifetime warranty. Now, hobbyists and home DIY fixers also use the ProTech toolkits for doorknobs, eyeglasses, cabinet doors, sink fixtures, and more. If you're looking for a great addition to an artist or hobbyist tool chest, folks, look no further. Best of all, there are thousands of iFixit guides for free to help you put your tools to use. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to fix it, and iFixit can help. Visit iFixit.com slash twit for more than 10,000 free step-by-step -step guides. iFixit also sells every part and tool that you'll need. Enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, and you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit.com slash twit, and use the code KNOWHOW to save $10. And we thank iFixit for their support of KNOWHOW. I love that thing. Oh, yeah. I have one in my garage, I have one at my desk, and I think I have one at my editing desk, even though I don't really need one there. I only have one because people keep taking all the kits. I don't know where this one went. <laughs> I knew it. Well, folks, as promised, we're going to give you the last bit of integration, because mm. if you've been building the uh, Alien X 450 class quadcopter, you're going to need uh, a little bit more before you take that bad boy up in the air. Hey, Alex. Push the magic button. In the last episode of Project Alien X, we physically integrated the mechanical and electrical systems of our quadcopter. In this segment, we're going to set up the radio and flight controller, check the rotation of our motors, experiment with center of gravity, and get our Alien X ready for its maiden flight. First, we need to set up our radio and make sure it's properly sending commands to the flight controller. Our receiver is an unbound FlySky 6-channel unit, but if your radio is already bound or you have a different set, you can skip to the flight controller segment. We bind our receiver to our transmitter using a bind plug, which is essentially a connector that shorts pins to each other. Plug the connector into the battery slot on the receiver, then power up the Alien X. The status light on the receiver should start to quick flash. Now take your transmitter, and while holding the bind button on the rear of the unit, turn it on. The status light on the receiver should stop flashing, indicating that the receiver is now bound to the transmitter. Remove the battery from the Alien X. If you're using your transmitter with several receivers, this is a good time to set up another flight profile so that you can store specific sub-trims, throttle curves, and channel settings for each of your craft. Cycle your transmitter, reconnect power to the Alien X, and the KK screen will report an error, because it hasn't yet been configured. The four buttons below the screen from left to right are back, up, 
down, and enter. Hit enter to drop into the menu. Our first stop is receiver test. Highlight the option, then hit enter. You'll be given a screen that shows you the values the flight controller is getting from the receiver. We need to check that the right control inputs are going into the right channels and that their directions are not reversed. Assuming that you're using a mode 2 transmitter, pushing full forward on your right stick should change the elevator value to forward, while pulling full back will change it to back. Pushing the right stick to the left should change the aileron value to left, while pushing it to the right should change it to right. Pushing the left stick all the way back should bring the throttle to idle, while pushing it forward should bring the throttle to full. Pushing the left stick to your left and right should change rudder to left and right respectively. Flipping your auxiliary 5 channel should toggle auxiliary between on and off. If any of those inputs didn't cause the appropriate response in the flight controller, you need to recheck your receiver to flight controller wiring and or reverse a few channels on your transmitter. Staying in receiver test, the next step is to set the subtrims. You want your elevator, aileron, and yaw values to be zero when the sticks are at rest, and you want your throttle to read zero when it's pulled all the way back. Adjust the subtrim controls on your transmitter until you get as close to zero for those values as possible. Now let's set the craft type. Scroll down until you're highlighting Load Motor Layout, then press Enter. This is the menu that lets us tell the controller what kind of craft it will be controlling. Navigate to Quadcopter X Mode and hit Enter. You'll be asked to confirm your selection. Hit Yes. The following screen will show you ESC arm assignments and motor rotations. This is a good reference if you ever need to troubleshoot your electrical system. Now let's back out of motor layout and navigate to ACC calibration and hit enter. This function will calibrate all of the accelerometers on the flight controller to assume that its current position is level. For that reason, you want your quad to be on a level, vibration-free surface before hitting continue. Once you press enter, don't touch the Alien X again until the screen reports that calibration is complete. Self-level is the flight controller function that will automatically adjust motor speeds to keep the craft level. Navigate to Mode Settings and hit Enter. The first entry should be labeled Self-level and it should read AUGS. If it doesn't, change it to AUGS. This setting allows you to toggle the KK self-leveling function from your transmitter at any time, simply by switching Auxiliary Channel 5. This is a great tool if you want to practice manual flight while having the option of switching self-leveling back on if you start to lose control. Back out of mode settings and navigate to self-level and hit enter. We'll go in-depth into the P and I settings in a future episode, but for now set P for 30 and I for 20. With the flight controller squared away, it's time to check the rotation of your motors. Important note, always do this with the propellers off. In fact, you should work with your electronics always with the propellers off. Remember that we want motors 1 and 3 to spin clockwise, while 2 and 4 should turn counterclockwise. Back the menu to the save screen, then push the left stick all the way down and to the right. You should hear the flight controller beep telling you that the motors are armed. Advance the throttle slowly until the motors start spinning. Then back the throttle off and watch motor 1 to see its rotation as it slows. A piece of tape on the shaft will help you see which way it's spinning. Repeat the process until you know the current rotation of every motor. Save the motors by pushing the throttle down and to the left and power down your Alien X. If any of the motors are not spinning in the right direction, you simply swap any two of the motor leads. It doesn't matter which two. Power the Alien X back up and try the test again. Once you verify that they're all spinning in the proper direction, we can now calibrate the ESCs. Start the process by turning everything off. Turn on your transmitter and advance the throttle to full. Hold down buttons 1 and 4 on the KK and continue to hold them through the entire process. Connect the battery and the controller will enter pass-through mode. You'll hear a beep once all four ESCs have calibrated for 100% throttle. Continue to hold the KK buttons and move the throttle to idle. You'll hear another set of beeps to confirm calibration of 0% throttle. Release the KK buttons and disconnect the battery. Now it's time to install your propellers. Once again remembering rotation, you want clockwise props on motors 1 and 3 and counterclockwise on 2 and 4. If you get confused, just remember that you want the prop turning in a way that its pitch will push air down. If you used Emacs motors and the carbon fiber props that I suggested, then the props have a D design that will lock them onto the motor shafts. Once in position, lock them with the prop nuts. The last step in tuning our Alien X is to balance it. We want the center of gravity to be the center of the flight controller. Luckily, there are two holes to either side of the flight controller mount. 
I made a balance hook out of a wire coat hanger that will grab the Alien X by those holes and allow me to see if the craft is level. Being an elongated X craft, we're most concerned with leveling the front and rear, and the balance of the craft can vary wildly depending on whether or not you have a camera mounted on the clean plate. Luckily, we can move the placement of the battery to balance against weight that is or is not in the front. There are many methods to secure batteries to the Alien X, but I like to use a Velcro strap in conjunction with Velcro pads on the lower frame and battery. Holding the craft with my wire hook, I can shift the battery forward and aft in order to achieve balance. With our center of gravity set, it's time to check our handiwork. Put the Alien X on a level surface, turn on your transmitter, connect the battery to the ESCs, and verify that the KK is in safe mode and that auto level is off. Stand about six feet behind the craft and arm your motors. Advance the throttle to about 30%. You want the prop spinning, but not fast enough to lift the quad off the ground. If the Alien X starts to lift off, reduce throttle. Move the right stick forward and check to see if the craft lifts off the rear landing struts. You may need to throttle up slightly if full forward doesn't do anything. Pull back to see if it leans back on the rear struts. Remember that we want just enough power to lean. If you pull too much or give too much power while testing, you'll flip the quad and break at least the prop, so be gentle. Do the same test for the left and right movements and yaw. If everything checks out, then you're ready to fly. And next time, we're gonna do just that. Damn. A smooth landing, Brian. That was so very smooth. smooth. <laughs> now, uh, this thing, you know, I gotta say, uh, I like the 250 just because I could take that thing out anywhere. Yeah, you're more of a performance guy. You like to zip around, do flips, stuff like that. But when you get this thing moving with a camera and you, you, you're you trying to get that shot, so you're trying to keep it level and you're trying to like make it circle around the target, it's, yeah. it's actually a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you didn't use something like this to do the bobblehead video? Uh, yeah, this yeah. was this was the bobblehead video. So the the, uh, the bobblehead was mounted on the top plate, and I had the GoPros sitting, facing back. Facing back. Yeah. Uh, people have asked, well, what what do I do for accounting for the weight of the GoPro? Well, that's why this battery tray here can move mm -hmm. the battery forward and back. And right? Slide it around, yeah. Right? And that all depends on how much weight you've got on the front of the craft. Uh, you, all you need to do is balance with these these points that are drilled into the uh, the top deck. Mm -hmm. And if you can balance it right now, this is way, way too f f forward heavy. But it's accounting for no the battery. battery right? Right. There's no battery there. Uh, before you fly it though, and we actually had this question in the group, someone was saying, I've noticed that it's accelerating very slowly. Whenever I hear someone accelerating very slowly and they're not crashing, it's normally because it's so imbalanced. Mm. Because what happens is, like for example, if this is nose heavy like this, it means that the front motors have to operate at a much higher RPM in order to balance the craft. Right, right? to compensate. So when I go to increase throttle on the front engines, there's not much left. I've already used most of it just to keep it level. Right, right. If you balance the craft, it means all of your motors are going to be operating at the same RPM to keep it level. And make it more responsive. You bet. That's mm -hmm. how it works. Now, in the next episode, we're actually going to take this thing out. We're going we're gonna to go fly. It's a let's fly. We're going to give this to Brian because this is going to end up being his quadcopter because I built my own 250. And uh, we're going to show you how you set the, uh, the, uh, the the settings here. So there's the the, the uh, like the P settings and the I settings and the stick scaling settings. That will all determine how your quadcopter will handle. And you can set it so that it's forgiving or it's acrobatic. That's all with a flick of a switch. And we're going to show you how to do it in the next episode of Know How. Yeah, because uh, I'm I want to use this for filming. Yeah, so I'll probably have a throttle setting that's less, um, not jarring, but just have a wide range in the middle to just like kind of have it hover, you know? So if I'm do little increments on the throttle, it doesn't make it jerky or right. anything. And actually we, this, we will be doing upgrades to this. And one of the things we're gonna upgrade is this flight controller. So this is a $20 flight controller. Mm -hmm. We're gonna replace it with a far more advanced flight controller that includes GPS, which will do things like you flick a switch and it knows keep this altitude and this position. That's which is exactly great what I want. If you're yep. filming. Mm hmm. Yeah. Cool. Now, uh, before we get into the next segment where uh, Brian's going to be showing us how to make your own smartwatch, I mean, move over Apple and Google because well, he's got. He's I mean, got it's the real kind deal. of smart. It's, it's kind, kind of, of smartish. Smart a smartish watch. It's fun. It's a it, fun problem. It's a watch you need to be smart. To put together, it helps. It helps. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I was qualified for that, but <laughs> yeah. but before I'm we do that, dual wielding. Uh, before he dual wields, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of Know How. Now, Brian, hmm. I've noticed that you're getting a little um, 
scraggly. Yeah, that tends to happen. Um, you know, I don't like to shave that often, but uh, when I do, I fortunately have Harry's to, <laughs> to count on. <laughs> I've been using the same blade that I when I first got this kit, and that was like three months ago. I, I, I'll say this. I, I probably shouldn't say this because this is out in live. When we first got Harry's as a sponsor of the Twit TV network, I was mm -hmm. like, shaving sponsor. I mean, I just use I use those disposable blades. What's right. the blah, 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 blah. Like, how am I gonna? How does that make sense? Like toolkit? Yes, I understand that. But yeah. shaving. But you know, after the first couple of times you use it, you go, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. So th yeah, this is why. Yeah, well, and it introduced me to um, face face lotion, which <laughs> is like, I thought that was a myth. I'm like, why would know. you do that to your face? Yeah. Now, uh, now we love Harry's because, well, I mean, we need to shave. He has to shave way more than I do. But I when I do, kind of hairy. I I actually do want to pamper myself a little bit. I want a good shave. I want a clean shave, and I want a shave that's going to be smooth. Now, you could do what I used to do and go to the supermarket and buy mm. budget blade replacement. Things. Well, yeah, like, like the handles are super cheap, but then super when you cheap. actually want to go get the blades, it's behind the glass, and you have to pay like an exorbitant amount of money for them. Yeah, and they're locked away behind a locked case because, you know, they're like gold. Right. <laughs> it's great, yeah. <laughs> Biggest oh. scam ever. Or you could just have Harry's delivered to your door each and every single week. Now, Brian and I have both learned to love Harry's because Harry's stands for quality. They make their own blades. They build their own kits. They give you lotion that's smooth and just feels right. Smells good. It feels good. Now, you know, they, they fix a problem that a lot of us have, and we just talked about that, and that's paying too much for subpar shaving, for just thinking that shaving is a routine rather than something that you should enjoy. Shaving should be fun, and that's what Harry's understands. Oh, we understand that razors are expensive. They run about $4 a blade. A guy who shaves every day spends hundreds of dollars a year just on razors, and when you do go to the store, you, you're kind of treated like a criminal. Well, don't do that. Get Harry's. Harry's gives us high quality razors at about half the price of those big brand blades. They make their own razors at a factory in Germany. They engineer them from sharpness and for high performance, and they ship them for free to your front door. And because they make and ship their own, own blades, Harry's is a more efficient company, which means you get factory direct pricing. Now, they guarantee your satisfaction. That means in each kit, you get a razor with a handle that looks and feels great. Three razor blades and foaming shave gel. The Starter Truman set is an amazing deal. You can get all of this for just $15. I've been using Harry's, and so has Brian, to give me that clean, close, and comfortable shave. We like the look, we love the feel, and hey, we agree with the price. Harry's costs half as much as the razors at the store. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to enjoy your personal grooming. Go to harrys.com and get $5 off your first purchase with the code KNOWHOW. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. We thank Harry's for their support of KNOWHOW. Yes. Uh, Brian, I see this sort of retro sign up here. That, I think that's our TD telling us that we're about to do some retro tech. Hmm, maybe. I, guess, I don't know if we did that on purpose or if he's just <laughs> messing with us. Um, but yeah, this is like a little do-it-yourself project. It's a, a wearable because, you know, the hot thing is the Moto 360 and eventually the Apple Watch, whatever. But uh, this will only cost you about, I think it's $30. It's uh, an Adafruit project, if you've heard of that website. So um, they do a bunch of like do-it-yourself kits and things. And this was just a, kind of a fun thing that I wanted to try out and um, show you a video of how to do it. So to start off this project, here's everything that comes in the kit from Adafruit, and here are the tools that you will need. A soldering iron, some soldering wire, some clippers, and uh, hopefully you have some helping hands to hold the board. First we're going to put the board into some clamps and get started with our first uh, resistor. This is a 10K resistor, and you can tell that by it is being marked brown, black, orange, and gold. Also, it's the only resistor in the kit that comes in that color, and it's separate from the uh, a pack of other resistors there, so it's, it's separated from the pack. So the first thing you're going to want to do is bend the wire leads so that the resistor can sit flat against the board. Uh, and then you can flip it over and push the, the wires out so that it doesn't slip out from away from the board. So next, grab your soldering iron and it's time to heat up the round ring pad around the wire. Uh, what you're going to want to do is heat that up and then put the soldering up against that to get a clean solder um, against it. We want to clean up uh, the leads but in clipping them and this makes it easier to start soldering some of the other joints. 
Um, next, we're going to grab the little yellow blobby thing. This is a, a 0 0.1 UF capacitor. Uh, and so ceramic capacitors, like resistors, are not directional. So you can put these in any which way you want. Um, and so just bend the leads and flip over the board and then solder the two legs, just like you did with the previous resistor. So next is time to take out the remaining resistors that are all packed together. These are 47 ohm valued uh, resistors and they are colored yellow, violet, black, and gold. And you can place all eight of them on the board as needed, uh, but I will be doing it one at a time to kind of make it easier on myself. And all the places where the resistors are supposed to go are marked on the board with uh, you know R1 through eight. So take your time, make sure to heat up the pads and place the solder in on that to get a good uh, solder joint. Next, you're gonna wanna clip all the remaining leads and clean up the back of the board. And then next up, we're coming up on a, a chip that has eight legs and is labeled DS1337. This chip is the real time clock or the timekeeper, and it's a low power circuit whose only task is to keep track of the time. So, what the but this, unlike the resistors, does have to face a certain way. So, make sure that you have the um, half circle and circle pointing uh, the right direction, like I have it here in the video. Next, we're going to do the big microcontroller chip. Uh, this is pretty much the brains and displays the button handling. Uh, most of the time it's in like a sleeping mode, but uh, if you press a button it wakes up to show the time. So when you press into the holes, make sure each pin has made it into the matching hole and is sitting flat against the board. And just like the other chip that we plugged in, it has to face a certain way. So make sure you've got that facing the right way with the uh, half circle and little circle facing the way I have it. And just, you know, check it twice to make sure you have the pin, the, the chip facing the right way. And then solder all 28 pins. This will take a little bit of time, but uh, be patient. And as if you're anything like me, you'll get a little bit better at it each time you go, uh, each next joint you solder. Next, it's time to place the battery holder and the timing crystal. So we'll be doing this pretty much at the same time. Uh, the timing crystal has a, a, a little quartz crystal in it that resonates, which helps uh, keep the time. Uh, the battery holder does have a special way it has to go in, so make sure you slide the battery in uh, by having the open side facing out. And then the crystal can go in either way. It's symmetric, pretty much just like the resistors. These joints are a little bit bigger so you'll have to use a little bit more solder and just take your time and keep adding solder until you've uh, uh, got them secured to the board and then also remember to solder the two points for the crystal pin and then the last thing that we have to solder are the two buttons that will be on either side of the board uh, they should snap into place and like the battery uh, they take a little bit more solder to to solder to the board but uh take your time and it shouldn't be too difficult and then finally the the part that will be displaying the watch is the led matrix and the matrix is not symmetric so it has to go in the right way so make sure that you have the lettering facing uh, the way I have it facing in the video. Also, double check that the 28 pins of the microcontroller uh, pins aren't in the way of the matrix, and it should be able to sit flat and flush on the board. It has little feet on each end of the, uh, the panel that should be able to press fully down to the board. Now it's time to solder all the uh, little pins from the matrix. You could clip the leads, but they're pretty short, so I just left them intact and uh, soldered along. Once you've soldered the matrix to the board, then uh, you can get the rubber uh, watch band and the clear plastic bottom together and fit those together inside of the band. And make sure when you put the battery in that it is uh, the fa flat side is facing up and the bumpy side is facing down. You can wake the watch by pressing either side button and then you can also uh, dial in the time it goes year and then month and then date and then hour and then you can choose if you want a 12 or 24 hour day and there are a couple of different display modes that you can play around with um, but that's about it it's a pretty it took me about an hour to put it all together and it was a fun uh little kit to practice soldering and uh, now you have your own 30 dollars wearable watch 
I, I, I really like that. You know, it's, it's this idea of building something rather than just buying something. That's kind of like the spirit of know-how. Yeah, I mean, you get the, the soldering kit out and you, you kind of make a few mistakes as you uh, warm up. Uh, and then by the end of it, like I was making better solder joints and stuff on here. And it, it's fun. Like you, you start to learn all the different components. It's got resistors and the little chips and stuff on here. Um, it's just, it's fun. It's a fun project. It took me about an hour to do. And now and I you learn. Play. Yeah. You learn. And I will tell you this, because you're going to DEF CON this year with me, right? Mm -hmm. We're heading out to the desert. I, you will get so much more cred wearing one of those than you would if you were airing, wearing <laughs> a, a smartwatch from some fruit vendor. Well, and so the, you put it together, and then uh, the next thing that I want to do with it is do like custom watch faces and stuff right now. Because like, you can solder it all together, and then it already has uh, the stuff loaded on memory, so you can play with it right away once you solder it. But um, you can get an adapter, so you can hook it up to your computer, and you can do like whatever you want at that nice. point. So I'll play with it some more. Um, I like it a lot. So, but it's, I mean, it's not going to replace my Mother yeah, 360, no, but I but will dual wield it. You made that. You yeah. built that. And yeah, that's a cool. conversation starter. It's fun. It's fun. I like this stuff. Yeah. You could just tell them it's the prototype for the next Apple Watch. This is the next Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I like it. I think it's cool. Yeah. Now, of course, we've got all the links. So if you want to know where you where you get it, if you want to find the instruction <laughs> And uh, if you pages, want a sol solid gold one, if you see, <laughs> no, that doesn't exist. You're not going to pay more than $30 I mean, we could for make this. it. I mean, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Anyone want to pay about $30,000 for uh, an Adafruit watch? We, we can do yeah. that. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, before we go, mm -hmm. I know it's been a while since we've done a parting shot because someone, I don't know who, someone was <laughs> so, It's like he wants to go home or something. He just doesn't like fun. Is yes, what it is. He doesn't like fun, but we're going to make him like fun because what we have right now is an experiment, Brian. Uh -huh. Now, you've heard of, of lossy compression before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, a wave format or something. Well, wave would be like unlossy, so that's right. lossless. But oh, okay. like MP3, the reason why you can get those files so small is because you're actually discarding some information. And compressing. And compressing. And then, and then you don't, it doesn't sound as good. It doesn't, know? well, uh, that's, well, that's debatable. debatable I think Alex would debate that. Alex would debate. The, the, well, He's audio a musician. Files. Then, audio yeah. files will say, look, I want uncompressed. I want the whole thing. I want it as high quality as I can possibly get. But most people listening to most styles of music can't really tell the difference between lossless and lossy compression. Right. I mean, you can if you if you really know what you're looking and for. And you have the right headphones and everything yeah. like that, yeah. But I thought what we'd want to do is we'd want to take a look at a project that a man by the name of Ryan McGuire did. He wanted to show people exactly what you lose when you use lossless compression or lossy compression. So, so Alex, go ahead here. and run this. Uh, this is Tom's Diner. That's do 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 Oh, okay, yeah, that's pretty famous. But what he's done is all you're seeing and all you're hearing are the pieces of audio and the pieces of video that are actually pulled out of the file when you use lossy compression. So this is the, okay, everything that's missing. This is the minus. This is everything that's missing. So if you, you hopefully you've got Tom's, Tom's Diner running in your head right now, and he did the same thing for the music video. The, these are the bits of information that actually get that left behind. He compared a compressed version of the song with an uncompressed version, and this is everything that was left over. This is really weird. Trippy. It's super, super, super <laughs> it is like a really strange dream. Yeah, the first time I watched this, I was like, ah. But this is actually kind of cool. This, this, this is a visual representation of, of the things that you lose when, when you talk about uh, lossy compression. Huh. And it's also a very good example of why they say these little bits and pieces can be removed without losing the experience of the song. Huh, okay. I, I almost want to just do a side by side because I'm. But I'm then we would have a DMCA. Right. Now, <laughs> and that would be bad. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, that's fascinating. So, folks, what you want to do is uh, go to YouTube and go ahead and search for Tom's Diner and just listen to Tom's Diner and then listen to that. And that's all of the stuff that gets left <laughs> out when you listen to a lossy version of Tom's Diner. I, I am kind of tripping. Brilliant. Totally tripping out right now. Oh, man. On, it's wait. like that music video I watched when I was yeah, watching right, that just, music video. Yeah, Bella, yeah, uh, huh. Okay, I wonder, could we do that with one of our episodes? Like, could we... Re I don't I, know, actually, I have to talk we, to Alex we always about record, that. We record everything in, in a lossy version, so... Yeah, MP4, I guess. Version. Or... 
Uh, I guess I have to talk to Alex about that. Mm. Well, there you have it, folks. It's a not just a parting shot. It's a moment of techno zen. Man, where did we just go? I don't know, but I'm, I'm tripping glad to, glad to out. Be back. <laughs> uh, folks, we know that this was a lot of information for one show, so guess what? We made sure that you get show notes. If you want instructions for the Alien X Quadcopter project, if you want to find the links for when Brian, where Brian bought, brought, bought his Adafruit watch, just go to our show notes page. And Brian, where did they find that? That is at twit.tv slash kh. Uh, you can follow all our past episodes there and look through our copious amounts of show notes. Uh, like Padre said, all the links with, actually, I think you've been putting prices in for things too oh, yeah. and doing totals for people. Although, uh, I will say one thing. Um, uh, I didn't know we would do this, but evidently the demand for the quadcopter stuff has been so high that uh, many of the links that we've given for buying things no longer work because Ooh. they sell out or they kill the <laughs> server. Uh, well, there's not too much we can do about Sorry. that. We try. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, you'll want to go there to find our links. Uh, you can budget the stuff that you want to buy. And uh, you can also subscribe and download lossless <laughs> formats to whatever device you want. I, lossy, Brian. Lossy? 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 lossy. Yeah, we're no. All lossy. We're all lossy. Loss Lossy. Lossless totally would be no, no, that, no would be, loss. that would be pure. That'd be raw. And okay. We can do that. So audio is recorded lossless, but the video is recorded lossy. But the exported audio is both, uh, or the exported show is lossy. both video and yeah. audio lossy. And actually, our exported video will look gray. I will look very gray. <laughs> that's just that's how it works. Yeah, that is strange. Yeah. I don't know why that changed. Yeah. But uh, also, don't forget that we've got a Google Plus page. Just go to G Plus and look for Know How. You're going to be able to find our community. We've got what 8,300 members. Avid members. Avid yeah. Members crashing is, their quads. It is a great place to ask questions or to post your projects. Mm -hmm. If you post your projects, you're going to find out that we, we use a lot of them on the show. So if you want to show off your skills, great place to go. That's uh, Google Plus. Just look for know how. And that's not the only place that we can be found on the social media. No, sir. You can also find us on Twitter. I am at cranky underscore hippo. I am at Padre SJ. Follow us, and we'll be telling you what we're going to be doing every week. And you yeah. can suggest topics for future episodes and you could also follow someone who I think is absolutely essential yeah, if you yeah. want to know what's going on and know how. That's Alex Gumpel. Mm. Oh, warning. That's Alex Gumpel. At Gumpel at A N E L F three. Follow He's him. He's really into quadcopters. He really likes quadcopters. So if you do go to his Twitter, Start just be, be warned. Yeah. There's going to be quadcopters. Yeah. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. Go. Yeah, go play with quads. Build a little watch thing. Right?